Okay, this is gonna be more of a hands-on kind of thing than me sitting up here and, and lecturing, okay? Uh, did everybody bring a laptop that has one of these? Good. Okay. You could, yeah, you need, you need a laptop to install the software. If you don't have one. You said to have one of these. I'm sorry. Just one. You need a laptop. Okay. It's you know. um, Okay, and that's actually going to be a kind of a, a part of what we do today is install the software. Now, I only brought one of these um, memory sticks. Okay. Uh, so you folks are going to have to share it. But basically, we're going to be installing the IDE 1.03. So if you are comfortable with downloading it from the net, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we can just pull it off here. Now, the Arduino IDE um, is available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, 32-bit and 64-bit. Now, is anybody here doing 64-bit Linux? Right. Okay, you're going to have to download over the net because I didn't put that version on here, and I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I realized that afterwards, like, more and more people are using 64-bit Linux. So uh, what you do is you go search for Arduino 1.01, download. It should show up on the list, and you'll click the 64-bit uh, uh, 64 64-bit version. 1.03. Uh, 1.03. Okay. So how many people are Mac? You're a Mac, and you're a Mac, okay? So you're gonna to wanna to take the Mac version of this off. And my experience with Mac stuff is it installs pretty, pretty smoothly. So why don't we get started? And I'll be talking in. You've got it installed? Okay. And then, then we'll start doing the Windows installs. So uh, you should find it on there and it'll be, it'll be on the Mac OS for you. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing. Today is meant to be a, a kind of an easy one. Okay, we want everybody to uh, succeed. So this is what the robot will eventually look like. Um, but for today, all we're doing is we're going to build this and we're going to program it with some LEDs and make the LEDs blink. Okay? So it's meant to be fairly easy. The next class will, I lost the wheel, be We'll be building the rest of this platform. I don't think we're actually going to be putting these feelers out there. I don't think they're necessary. The rest of this platform and making the robot move back and forth. You folks are welcome to come on in. Okay. Um, so um, this is a Raspberry Pi. That's not part of uh, phases one, two, or three. That will, that will come a little later as, as we people show interest. Okay. Um, so. You're not going to get this robot this time. It'll be the next class where you'll actually have a robot that the wheels. We just wanted to make sure that everybody had all their software installed. Okay. The purpose of today is to sort of get things started. So robotics is a combination of software, hardware, I should say electronics. And mechanical. Oh, we got one. If you have seen our Homebrew Robotics Club logo, robots are a combination of mechanical things like motors and wheels, electronics, and, and software. You have to load the software onto the thing. We're going to be focusing mostly on electronics and software today, but with a little bit of mechanical. Okay. So this is what we're building today, okay? And this is called a solderless breadboard. And we'll be putting uh, some LEDs, light emitting diodes on here, and at least blinking one of them. We'll be programming this chip 
this board. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to do some mechanical stuff here. The, the way I tend to build robots is with pegboard. The reason I like pegboard is because it's got a bunch of holes drilled in, into it. So for example, this little electronics module will fit right on here. We'll be able to bolt it through the holes that are already there to attach it to the robot. The brackets here are the same way. You'll be able to just bolt, bolt it on here. So the reason why I use pegboard is because it's cheap, okay? You know, we bought a six, four foot by eight foot piece for about $35, okay? And I, you know, I've got tons of it lying around in the garage. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna let some of you, or actually all of you, uh, try cutting it with just a hacksaw, okay? Now, I, I find that cutting with a hacksaw to be more exercise than I'm used to, but uh, the reason why we're gonna do it that way is so that you folks can basically see that there's really no reason why you can't work with a material like this, okay? And, well, I don't want everybody to go off and go to a lumber store and buy a bunch of a four by eight sheet of uh, pegboard. Uh, basically, I'm perfectly happy with slicing off pieces of pegboard for people and handing it to them. We might suggest that when people want to practice their, their hacksaw skills to go over the trash can so we don't make too much money. Oh yes, please. Okay, so uh, for uh, we pre-cut all the boards because we didn't want to have this class take forever as everybody tried to, to cut their own. So we thought we'd save, you know, we want everybody to like, give, you know, give the hacks off, a little, little uh, push back, push back and forth. Um, one of the things you'll learn is for these smaller children, they frequently don't have the mechanical strength not he, he's he's going to do just fine, but some some of the others might have, might have to worry a little, and the parent might need to help out. Okay, uh, so that that's and keep your fingers yes in. Yeah, we're 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 coming to that. Okay, okay. So here's hacksaws. Okay, uh, you can cut metal with a hacksaw, and later on in the next phase we'll be cutting these little angle brackets. And again, I'm gonna do the favor and cut them all for you, but we'll let you all give a chance. It's a lot harder to cut aluminum. You can actually cut steel with a hacksaw. Um, not all steel, but a lot, lot, lots of steel can be cut with it. Um, so this is a very useful general purpose tool. Now, there are two kinds of hacksaws. This is the hacksaw that has been around for eons, okay? Uh, you know, I don't think this is my dad's, but it could have been, okay? The more interesting one is this one, okay? Um, and it's a basically the same hacksaw blade, but with this, this really funny looking, you know, looks like a P to me, uh, handle. And what's nice about that is, oops, you can keep cutting down like this without running into this thing like that, okay? Now, if you go to Harbor Freight and buy a hacksaw, they sell one that has one of these things attached to the blade. So you would want to get both of these if you can, okay? I highly recommend it. A hacksaw at Harbor Freight it's about a little under five dollars, okay? Uh, and if you get one of their coupons, you can even get it a little cheaper. Okay. Does everybody know what Harbor Freight is? It's a, it's a tool place there. The one I go to is on Stevens Creek and Lawrence, basically. Uh, and then if you live on the East Bay, there's one in Newark. There's okay. a big old shop just down the block, and just down the store. Yeah, so, so anyhow, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing some cutting like that. So in here, we have, <laughs> a solderless breadboard, okay? Um, and I, uh, let's, you, know, you can pull these, these things out if you want, but they are your kits, but try not to lose all the small pieces that are in there. That's why they're in the bag. Now what a solderless breadboard is, a, is a way of doing electronics prototyping 
without using a hot soldering iron. Now next time, we're going to bring the soldering irons in because we have to attach the wires to the motors. But this time, we're not doing that. Okay. Uh, so this is perfectly safe for children of all ages. No, I don't say all ages. You, you, know, you probably want them to be at least five, but you, know, you get the idea. Um, now in addition, down in here, we have the jumper cables. Okay, so these little wires plug into the proto boards. Okay, if you've never played with one of these things, you can just stick it in right like that. And wires are how you connect things uh, for electronics. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Okay. The other thing that's in there is your Arduino. So you should open up this up and take a look at your Arduino. Let's talk briefly about Arduinos. First off, Arduino is the name of a company. They're in, based out of Italy, and they started this about ooh, seven, eight years ago. And for, I don't know why it caught on. I'm happy it did. Uh, but this, this is the thing. So um, anyhow, this is an official Arduino. You can buy them at Radio Shack. Uh, they tend to be kind of pricey. I think I paid $35 for this one. You can fries a bunch of other yeah, I, think it, I don't know if Fry's sells official Arduinos, uh, but whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's official Arduinos. Now, there's a whole bunch of people making clones. So this is a sane smart Arduino. And um, the rule when you make a, a copy of one of these things, which is perfectly legal, it's open source hardware, is you're not supposed to use the word Arduino on it. Okay, you're supposed to use your own name. But if you look at these things very carefully, you will see that they are, for all intents and purposes, identical. Okay? And we paid a little extra to get these same smart ones because of that feature. Okay? Because not all Arduino clones are the same. Okay? But even so, there's a slightly different driver needed for the same smart one, but I think it just well, it will work out. Okay, but I want, wanted you to understand that. Now, you, you can buy other clone products and they might not work quite as well because of something called a serial driver. So I just want you to understand that. I'm actually gonna pass this one with the white back around. That's mine, and you can compare it against yours. So I'll start here and just pass it on. Okay, now in addition, in your bag, you have a USB cable. The USB cable plugs into plugs into this, and this is how you provide power and programming to your Arduino. Okay. Uh, so feel feel free to un un unpack it. And I'm, I'm actually getting near the end of my uh, presentation. We'll, we'll start going through those soon. Okay. Um, so basically, feel free to unpack all of that. Okay, now the last things down here in the, the bottom of the bag are some electronics. Okay. Be a little careful. It's easy to lose this stuff. It's not very expensive electronics. Um, so this thing here, which I can barely see, you probably can't see much better, is a resistor. And I'll explain briefly what a resistor is very soon. And then the uh, there are three different colors of LED in there. One's red. You know, so you've got two two red, two green and two yellow LEDs. And you know, why did we give you different colors? Just for fun. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, and um, the, uh, they light up. Okay, and that, that's kind of the, the electronics. So we're basically going to be putting these into your protoboard, hooking wires across, and getting, getting the, the, this thing to, to blink up. In addition, we're going to get the software running to the point where it blinks. And that's kind of the, the whole purpose of today's class. Polarity. Okay, I'll ex explain briefly about the polarity. So now I'm going to give you electronics in five minutes. Okay? I'm not sure I'll make it quite in five minutes. Uh, I've misplaced the... You're uh, going from. Okay. Electronics. Uh, Are you going to start with quad mechanical? Uh, no, I'm not. But your zone is long. We're not even doing zones off, folks. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is called a schematic. Okay. This is meant to represent the electronics, but be easy to draw. Okay. So that little thing with the that was straight is a resistor. And this is a, something called a diode. You know, it's a light emitting diode. And when to indicate that it's light emitting. We'll put three dashes like that on to indicate that it is designed to emit light. This is a battery. Everybody's done batteries, right? You know, you, you gotta plug them in, you gotta put plus sign and minus sign. And then these wires are called, th these lines correspond to wires. So what is a wire? A wire is a hose for electron plumbing. And that's what electronics is, moving electrons around. So when we need to move electrons from the battery to the diode to the resistor and back to the battery, we use wires. Okay. So what, is, what does the battery do? The battery is an electron pump. It moves electrons around. Okay. Um, so the, the, the basic thing on this is that you have the, um, the battery pumping I have to be a little careful here. You know, most people don't know this, but Benjamin Franklin started figuring out this electricity stuff, and he kind of figured out there was something called an electron, but he didn't know what sign to give it. Okay, so he thought electrons were going to be positive, and when the scientists finally figured it out, they were negative. And it's been a confusion for electronics all along. So just bear with me, and let me just say that. The current goes this way, from positive through here back to negative. Turns out the electrons actually go the other way. It's confusing as all get out. Okay, so the battery is the thing that pumps the electrons around. When the, the, the electrons go through the diode, they emit, it emits light. And when it goes through the resistor, it emits a little heat, okay? The reason why we have the resistor there is because we don't want to burn up the diode. We'd rather have the heat get dissipated here than here. If you try to put too much current through a diode, it gets really bright and it goes away. It's gone, never to come back again. So if you don't put the resistor there, it won't light up. Now the other thing about the diode is it's got a positive side and a negative side. Okay, now if you pull out one of those diodes and look at it closely, I recommend you pull out one of the yellow diodes. You will see that it looks kind of like this. It's got two leads, one is longer than the other, okay? The long lead, 
short wave are positive and negative. So this is the positive, and that's the negative. The way I was taught this thing <coughs> is that the positive lead is a little, has a little extra on the end. Okay, so you can do it. So does everybody see the difference? Everybody's got, got a chance to look at that. Now what happened? Well, yes. Um, if the current is flowing that way, shouldn't the resistor be before the IO to this? It doesn't matter. It does doesn't not matter. matter. Okay. okay. Um, you can also do it this way. Okay, what you cannot do is this. I won't say you can't do it, but if you do, you're out of diet. This bad idea. Okay. Wait. Yeah. One other thing, if they're looking with the leads for whatever reason, don't cut them both the same length. Yeah, you don't want to cut them. You know, don't want to cut them. Okay. You know, for the breadboarding, you don't need to cut them. Now, what I want to say here is, is, is you know, what happens if you plug in a diode the other way? If you do it like this. And the answer is the diode is okay. You don't hurt the diode, but it doesn't light up. Okay, because it turns out diodes are one-way devices. Okay, they really have to have the current coming in here and going through them this way. If you do it the other way, they don't light up. That's all there is to it. So you can't hurt the diode as long as you have the resistor. Okay? And that's really, that's really the, the, the message I want to do here. And this is really all I wanted to say about electronics for now. So in summary, the battery, if you have one, is the pump that pumps the, the current around. This is the diode. The current goes through the diode and from here to there and lights up. And the resistor dissipates the extra heat that needs to be dissipated. Okay. Um, I also, I should mention, this diode symbol you see, this long line is the, is a, I view that as just like a big minus sign. So that's how you know which end of a diode is the minus sign. So these are, that, that's kind of all. Does anybody have any questions about this? I'm not, I don't want to lose people on this. Diodes are not very expensive. They're about 10 cents, okay? I have drawers full of them at home, okay? Um, so for what you have to do is extract. Okay. With the right one for your, if your yeah, windows. Yeah. Assuming yeah. we got the right one that matches our computer, and then you have to extract the zip file. Exact, first, extract the zip file. And, and then you do the Arduino and it pops It should it. do that. Yeah. I, and I, and I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, folks. I'm, how many people here are Linux people? Okay. I can do the Linux stuff just fine. Mac OS. I've never really had anybody have problems. Windows sometimes just gets me, okay? And, and we'll, ho hopefully we won't have too many problems tonight, but if we do, you may see me fumble around. The other thing we're gonna do tonight is we're going to drill some holes to hold the Arduino. So if you, you've got your Arduino, I'm gonna throw it here. You'll see it's got four mounting holes, here, 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 and here. Now, if you look closely on the back, what you'll see is on one of them. You see this silvery thing here? If you look on the back, you'll notice there just really isn't a lot of room to, to mount uh, things near, near that hole. So we aren't going to use that hole because if you have like a nut or something, you can actually short these pins. It's not a good idea. So we're only going to drill three holes. Okay. So let me talk about this in yours. Okay. Uh, drilling. Now there's two ways of drilling holes. So this is called um, a motor tool. Most of you have heard of them referred to as Dremels, Dremel motor tools. Um, I bought this a long time ago. It says Craftsman on it, but it's basically was it's a Dremel motor tool. Been relabeled as Craftsman. Craftsman. Okay. Um, a lot of people. It's not, it wouldn't be in there still. 
um, a lot of people like using Dremel motor tools. This is one way of uh, drilling holes. You put a drill bit in here. Let me talk about drill bits. When you're dealing with tools, it's extremely useful to pay the extra money for the box to store them in. Okay. Um, you may save a few cents by avoiding the box, but you're going to lose all the tool pieces. It's going to get, you know, you're basically throwing your money away. So whenever possible, I strongly recommend when you're looking along the, the, the things at Harbor Freight or something, if they sell it in a plastic box or a metal box, go for it. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would opt for a metal one if you have one. If, you have, if they give you the option of a metal one, those last longer. Okay. So this is another set of tools you'll notice. I, 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 we, we, I keep the packaging. Okay. And then, this is a screwdriver, same thing. Okay, well, this is a plastic one. Eventually, the plastic will break, and I will, the pieces will start to scatter to the wind. So, I want to talk briefly about drill bits. Okay. Back before the metric system was invented, all of the drill bit sizes were figured out in the United States and England. They're called imperial sizes. They do not make a lot of sense. Okay. There's actually three kinds of si uh, three groupings. There's something called fractional drill sizes. So this is a 13 30 seconds of an inch drill bit. Okay. And um, so those are fractionals, and they go all the way down to for a nine from one sixteenth of an inch to um, half an inch. So this is a half inch drill. You don't have to buy a complete set like this. A complete set costs, so when I bought this, it was about $65, and that was about you know, 20 years ago. Um, so that's fractional drills. The other set of drills are called letter drills, and they're labeled from, guess, how many people want to guess what the letters are? A to Z, okay? So A is this size drill, and then Z is this size. I've never even used this drill, it's, it's welded, it's almost welded in there, okay? The other set of drills are called number drills. They go from here to there. This is number one through number 80. Now all of my number, smaller ones are busted, okay? Because they're so small, they break real easy. I don't even replace them when I break them. So usually you want to be get to approximately, um, I, I, somewhere around here is where, where I, it's, they stop breaking, okay? So those are number drills. They, if you get a chart, if you go on the internet and you say drill chart, they will you have a drill chart which shows you the sizes of all the drills and they're interspersed. There'll be a fractional drill, a letter drill, uh, and then a number drill, two number drill, three, you know, it's just, they just interleave all the way. Confusing is all get out. And I'm sorry, but you can't do anything about it. Now, if in Europe, they use metric sizes, okay? They work a lot better. They make a lot more sense, okay? They are in reasonable increments. Um, so why do we use these size drills here rather than metric? I can buy these in this country. In me if you want to buy a metric set, you're going to pay a bit more money, okay? Um, so that's one issue. But the other issue has to do with hardware. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, hardware stores are where you buy nuts, screws, and everything, okay? This is a half inch flathead screw. Now screws, I should say, I should think it's a machine screw. So it's a flathead, Machine screw. 
What does machine screw mean? Machine screw means it's designed to put, screw into metal, basically, sometimes plastic. You can tell, distinguish it from a wood screw because wood screws taper on the end. Okay, we're not going to we, we aren't going to be using any wood screws in this class, but wood screws are perfectly good, but they're meant to be screwed into wood. So this is a flathead screw. The other kind of machine screw is basically a roundhead screw. Okay. Um, so this is flat. And then when it comes to the roundhead screws, there's a whole different bunch of names for them. Most people will use either pan or round. Okay. Um, we don't have any in the, in the kit. We only have flatheads. Okay. The length of the screw is measured from this surface. So your pan is, if you're measuring a screw, and let's say it's a half inch screw, for a pan head screw, it's from the bottom edge of the, the head to the tip. For a flathead screw, it's from the very, you can't see this, from the very top of the flathead to the tip. Okay? So, if you look at the top, you'll usually either see a cross or a slot. So it'll either look like that or it'll look like that. So this is a Phillips drive. I don't remember whether or not it's 1L or 2, I think it's 2. Okay. And this is um, a slotted screw back. And there, there are others. There, there are a gazillion others. If you want to, want to see just how many different kinds of screw heads there are, let's pass this around. And you can just sort of see them through the plastic. Don't, don't bother opening it up. OK. But there's a gazillion different drives. But these are the two most common. OK? When you're buying the screws, I recommend you get the Phillips head. They're easier to screw in and unscrew. Nothing, nothing's perfect, but how many of you have screwed in flathead screws and the, the screwdriver keeps jumping out? We have to keep trying to troubles. The reason why Phillips head screws were invented was to prevent you from having that problem as much. Okay? Um, we can strip both of them. Okay. Um, so, when you're buying screws, you need to worry about that. You need to worry about the head, the length. And the other thing you need to worry about is the diameter. OK. Um, screw, machine screw diameters in the United States are called number sizes. OK. They make no sense. OK. I shouldn't say they make no sense. They made sense to the people who did them, but for, for us now, they, they just don't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. So the number sizes go from number zero, we usually skip the odd ones, two, number four, number six, number eight, and number ten are the, the, the sizes. There's a few others, let's not worry about them. These Three sizes are the size that will cover most of the robotic stuff that we're going to do. Number four, number six, and number ten. Okay, these are number four screws. If you're in Europe, this is a 3.0 millimeter screw <coughs> in diameter. They have different pitches in Europe, but in, in, in here, it's, that's what we have. Okay. So you heard me use the word pitch. The pitch is how many threads <coughs> per inch, how many threads per millimeter you have, OK? In the United States, you can get these screws at every hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, and you know any place that basically sells screws are going to sell these kinds of screws. You can also, if you know where to shop, Biometric screws, okay? How many people here have heard of Olander? One or two, two you, you've heard of Olander, yeah, okay. I've been there. Been there, okay. Olander's a little hole in the wall uh, place. It has a vast, vast inventory 
of screws, nuts, and everything. Um, so the reason why we use these things is we can get them. Okay. Now, when it comes to pitch, there's a variety of different pitches for these screws. Nothing is easy, but we almost always use 440, 632, and unfortunately for 10, there's two of them. There's 1024 and 1032. And you, you got to support both of them. So tonight we're only doing 440s, okay? And the reason why we're using the 440 is because it fits through this hole, okay? A three millimeter screw fits through as well. The material issues are a little more complicated to, to, to deal with. There's a cost issue. Um, there's also the nylon screws are slippier, more slippery, okay? And sometimes they loosen up a little easier, okay? The other thing with the nylons is they stretch, okay? And sometimes that stretching is good, and sometimes it's bad, okay? And so that's kind of, and I, I, I can go into more detail, but I probably shouldn't do that right now. Um, the, uh, if you're a mechanical engineer, you worry very much about the materials that go into your screws. Okay, so the five things you need to know about the screws are length, um, diameter, your head, which is flat or pan usually, your pitch, which is the number of threads per um, um, thing, and then your drive. So that screw that the screws that you have in there are 440, which is a number four diameter, 40 threads per inch, flat head, Phillips drive, half inch. Okay? And so when you go into the hardware store, uh, how many people go into hardware stores? Yeah, all, everybody. Go walk down that long aisle that goes forever and ever, and go find the machine screws, and you'll just see them all there. And you'll, you'll, you'll say, oh, there's the flat heads, there's the round heads. Okay, they frequently don't give you a choice between drivers. They'll either be straight or Phillips, but usually not both. And so that's what's, what's, what's going on there. Now, almost done here. The, uh, in order to make this all work, we need to drill some holes tonight. Okay. And so when we're dealing with power tools, you should be wearing some sort of eye protection. Now, I don't have a lot of um, safety glasses, um, but, you know, you can put them on. They're not all that fun to look through, but you really don't want anything to go in your eyes, okay? Um, now, I'll be honest, since my eyesight's not all that great in the first place, I just use my glasses. An adult can make this choice. Children shouldn't make this choice. This should, you know, they, there's, there should be absolutely no choice on that. Children wear safety glasses, period. And if you don't have glasses, I would highly suggest that you wear safety glasses. Yes. If you have glasses. If you, if, okay, so if you're an adult, you don't wear you know, glasses. We're gonna, you're going to want to use a pair of, of safety glasses. Harbor Freight sells them. Everywhere. Lots yeah. of people. You know, so I unfortunately only have two of these tonight. I really only have two drills, so we're, we're, we're okay. Okay. So. And if, if you need to wear your glasses because your vision is pretty awful, you can get yes. guards for the side. So, so there's two kinds of safety glasses. There are these that are like, they look cool, right? I mean, they're not quite Ray-Bans, but. <laughs> okay. The other option, uh, and see showing another option, is you can get side guards for your regular glasses. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's actually a good idea. Uh, I, sh I should invest in some. Um, and then there are these. These go over your regular glasses. Like this. Yeah. You don't have to go to the goggle. Yeah. You can, you can, you can fit 
Some safety glasses are designed to go over your, your glasses. So if you, you need your glasses for eyesight, uh, you, you use these bigger ones, okay? If your eyesight's pretty good, you can use the, the ones with that, which have no optical correction, okay? So I just want to talk very briefly about how we drill holes. Um, step one is I've got to get a drill that fits through this hole. And I just sort of keep picking at them until I get one that is pretty tight fit. So it looks like I can do this with either a number 31 or a number 30 drill. The 30 drill is pretty tight. I'm going to do a 31. Okay. Then you need to install the drill, the bit into the drill. Okay. And I've got two different drills here. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put two bits in. Um, I'll actually do the installation, but if you want, if you want to play around after everybody's drilled their holes, let's 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 go for it. So, are we using a 440 to put these in? Yeah, you're putting 440s through. They fit right through. Yeah, I understand. Okay. So, um, this is a Dremel motor drill. Okay, it's got this thing called a collet that fits in here, and the bit fits in the collet. Sometimes I have to put the drill into the collet first and then the collet into there. And then you have this collet nut that screws on like this. And then for this one, you have to. Um, lock things up. So there's this little button here. This button prevents the, uh, the drill thing from moving. So I push that in, and then I use the collet wrench to tighten it up. Now the newer Dremel motor tools have something called a, 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 a hand uh, Jacobs chuck, so you don't have to deal with this stupid wrench. But this is a really old one. So I just tighten this thing up so it's tight and then it will uh, work just fine. Okay. And you'll notice I'm really careful about always reattaching the wrench to the tool. It's a pain in the rear when you lose the wrench, so that's why I do it. Okay. This is a pretty common uh, hand drill. Um, they come in all sizes. This is what I would call an intermediate size. Um, and you'll notice I've got the, uh, <laughs> the tool for opening and closing the chuck. This is the chuck right here. And the way it works is as follows. I hand tighten it here. And you see this little gear thing? It goes into this hole, and we tighten it. And then I put this thing back here before I lose it. I've had this drill for about 10 years, and you'll notice I still have the, the chuck. Most people lose the chuck. And sometimes when you lose the chuck, you can't find another one. And so you've got this drill that you paid all this money for, and you can't use it anymore because you can't find a chuck that fits into your chuck. Your, uh, thing. So, um, and then it drills. Now, safety. Safety is really important when you're using a power tool. What do you think is going to happen if I do something like this? Mm. It's going to hurt. Okay. So, what do you think is going to happen when I do this? It's going to hurt. The key thing is to always make for sure that the drill bit is not going to come near your hand. Very frequently, we will drill. We're using a hand tool like this, like this, and, and, and push it up. Okay, in fact, I'm gonna drill a hole right now. Okay. Now, this is gonna be a little messy, and I should have brought some newspaper. Uh, I'm gonna go see if I can get a vacuum. Yeah, what we wanna do is do all of the drilling in one place. Mm. 
why don't we do the drilling here and, and see, see how much of the, the, the debris we can get to go into the uh, Yeah, this is garbage. Yeah. Okay, almost done. So, um, when you're trying to mount something like this onto a board like this, what happens is most of us will try and grab a pencil, mark all the holes, and then try and drill all holes. And you know what happens? They usually don't fit afterwards. So what I do, and what a lot of people do, okay, notice that my fingers are nowhere near the, the thing. I will drill the first hole by just holding the board right there. Do it over the thing. And then you'll take the screw. And then you push the screw through. And you'll actually mount the board on there. Now, you'll notice that this screw doesn't go through. It's because it's flathead screw. A countersink is a very funny looking drill like this. I, I have one which has a handle on it somewhere around here that I wanted to use, okay? Did you guys get the software? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, when I find it, and I will, uh, what you do is you use the, the tool to bevel out room for this flathead screw. Okay. And, this is getting better, I need to put it in a little deeper. When, when you're all done, this thing will be perfectly flush with this board. Okay, and the, the screw will stick up, and but when you push this thing around on the table, it's not scraping on the screws. So it's okay to go a little deeper, but you really just want this thing, you know, you don't, you don't hear, hear the screws scraping, okay? So that's the other piece of this, okay? There's a countersink that I bought from Harbor Freight for $2. And it goes into this style of screwdriver, which is a mag it has a magnetic thing. So sorry, we'll have to do it with the hand one, which is a little unfortunate because the, this thing's a lot easier to um, hold. Okay, when we mount this on, is there a desired orientation? Yeah, there is. I mean, because this is where the plugs go in. So yeah. So. Up here or here? So what you want to do is kind of do it like this. Um, the, uh, and what you want to do is you want to be, well, the way I organize this is I left a whole bunch of holes along this edge, and then the Arduino goes here, a mounts on it, and the whole reason for all this is just so we can <coughs> plug wires between here and there, okay? So the other thing is, in order to attach the, breadboard to the pegboard, we have some double stick tape. Now, you, don't pull the, the other thing off the, off the bottom yet, okay? I'm going to tell you why I never pull it off, okay? And the reason why is you built your robot, you had a lot of fun, and now it's time to build your next robot, okay? And if you put pull the, the piece of backing off the thing, we have the Arduino, and we have the lock washer, and then we have the final nut. Yeah. Yeah. And the purpose of the lock washer is it prevents the nut from coming loose. So if you look deep in your bag, you'll find a little itty bitty round thing that looks like this. And it's got like a, a slot cut there. It's kind of twisted, okay? That is a lock washer, okay? If you, any of you have had to build things from like Ikea or something like that, you'll frequently run into lock washers. And it's just there to prevent the nut from un coming undone. And the little lock washer just sort of digs into the nut, 
It digs into whatever is underneath it and to prevents it from undoing. For robots, it's really, really important to use lock washers. Because otherwise, your robot will be wandering around, <laughs> and the vibration will be happening, and your screws will come undone, and next thing you know, everything's flopping around. And no matter what you do, the screws will fall out. They will fall out, <laughs> OK? Uh, we have some wonderful, fun examples of, of uh, bad things happening when the screws come undone. So that's what the lock washer is all there for. OK. Jeez. I was trying to wrap this up. Once you have drilled your first hole and mounted your first screw, you mount the board on there and you drill the next hole. And this hole already exists, so I'm not going to actually do anything here. Okay. So you take the, uh, unmount the board, and you mount the next screw on there. And then you put it back on and you do the third screw. If you do it this way, it's a lo little more labor intensive, all of your screws will line up with the holes on the board. Okay? And if you have an expensive CNC, you know, computer numerical control machine, you can have it align the holes perfectly every time. But it's, most of you don't have one. Okay? In fact, I suspect I'm the only person in the room that does have one. Uh, so, this is the way I recommend that we, we do the, um, uh, the screw things. Now, you can try to use a pencil and mark the board and try to drill the holes, but I pretty much guarantee you they won't line up. Now, what happens if you make a mistake? Anybody know? You flip it around, you try the other side. What happens if that doesn't work? Um, maybe you can move, it, move the board around and get some other holes. And what happens if that doesn't work? Buy a new one. Right. Okay, just throw it away, get another one. We have some extras. Okay, it's really, this is basically throwaway stuff. And so just don't, don't feel like, oh my god, I pushed, the, I pushed the hole in the wrong place. Yeah, mistakes happen. Okay, don't worry about it. Okay? And they will happen. Oh, they will happen all the time. The, the only mistake you really want to avoid is this mistake, okay? Now, even saying that, these things aren't nearly as dangerous as like a circular saw, okay, or a table saw. Those things will just rip parts of your anatomy off without even thinking about it, okay? So, yeah, right, okay? Uh, so you can hurt yourself with this, there will be blood, there may be stitches, um, but it's unlikely much more than that will happen, okay? Hacksaws, yes, you can cut yourself, hand hacksaws. You will stop in a real hurry because it hurts, okay? There may be a little blood, you may need a Band-Aid, okay? But it won't be that bad, okay? But let's not do that. I'd like to have zero accidents tonight, okay? And that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about this bill. And this is gonna be hands-on. There'll be some of, some of us here to help out with, uh, um, uh, when you have questions, and there will be questions, and we'll, uh, we'll work our way through. Did you bring the band-aids? I did not bring band-aids. So that's actually a good idea. I probably yeah. should have band-aids. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's a. Okay. I'm sure there's a first aid. I, I need. I need. To, you know, I I got saved here. Seal here reminded me that about the safety glasses. I totally forgot. It wasn't on my list. They would have been left at home. I was would have been going. Oops. So thank you so much, Seal. Yeah, and if you ever get involved in any kind of a robotics competition, you will be required to have safety lessons. Yes. Okay. So if you go, if you go to Robo Games, um, uh, and you may, you know, they have tabletop challenge at Robo, Robo Games. Um, they will insist that you have safety glasses. Why don't you go to Cal Games or go to first region? Cal Games first. I don't know about first Lego <laughs> League. I don't think they require it. Not no. First tech challenge. Tech challenge. They all require safety glasses. So it's you know that, no, that's the first tool you buy when you go into Harbor Freight. Uh, if you don't have these kinds of glasses, you buy you buy some safety glasses. Are we doing more after we put the software on? Yes, we are. We're actually going to do, do it. So, but I want to get people going on 
this stuff. And I'll be walking around and we'll be seeing, trying to get everybody's Arduino stuff up there. So there's, Chuck is helping, I'm, I'm doing it. Uh, the other instructor that was supposed to be here didn't show up tonight. So we're a little short of instructors. I was hoping to have one person with the drill, one person with the hacksaws, and one person doing so the, the software. Uh, so we're a little short, yeah. So you had you mentioned that people probably shouldn't uh, put a screw in a particular place, and it's yeah. Where the see, see this this little connector that has the the two by three connector on it. It's right near this silver USB thing. Don't put a hole. Don't don't put a hole there. Don't try. Okay, because it won't. Um, you won't be able to uh, do the get the the spacer screw to work there. Yeah, that, that one. And uh, whoever's working the drill, which will probably be me, uh, I'll, I will help you try and prevent that. Okay? So we do the other three. Though. Do the other three. By the way, you can, you can mount these things on two without any problems. The, this Raspberry Pi is held on with two. It's, it's rock solid. And you can take a look at his board. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay.